or just one, probably. They use their fake names right this way. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming to Snake News or Fake News, the game show. Um, before we get to the fun stuff, um, I'm going to give you a little background, especially for our contestants to make sure they have everything they need to win big. <laughs> now, I'll start off with introducing myself. I am Tara Cataldo. I'm the Science Collections Coordinator at the University of Florida. But I am just one small person on a very large research team. Um, our, our project is called Researching Students' Information Choices. And uh, there are researchers from the University of Florida, like myself, OCLC Research, and Rutgers University. And our project, summed up by the numbers, is a four-year IMLS-funded study where 12 researchers plus a eight-member advisory panel have teamed up together to study 175 students from fourth grade through graduate school. And we studied these students' behaviors using four Google simulations. And the sessions where they uh, came in and were uh, searching Google were recorded, transcribed, and then all the researchers spent time coding them, which resulted in what felt like over 1.5 million hours of coding. I mean, I'm just kidding about that number, but it really did feel that way. <laughs> Now, I know what you're thinking, what is a Google simulation? That's everybody's question. And we could, I spend half a day trying to explain what this is, or I could do a one minute video, and we're gonna go with that option. So students came into uh, uh, us for their research session, and we gave them a hypothetical research project that they were gonna be doing some research for, and that project was the effects of the Burmese python on the Florida Everglades. I'm sure state news. And they would come in, give them their topic, answer any questions they have, and then sat them down with a laptop, and then they saw this. A little news video kind of giving them a, a synopsis of the problem that Florida's having with snakes. Then they had their Google search, and they typed in whatever they wanted to do to search their topic. And then they were presented with Google search results to go through, and they went through five tasks. The helpful task where they picked resources that were helpful for their topic. They could open them up, if it was a video, they could play a video, if it was a PDF, it opened up a PDF, they interact just the way they would with Google, and then pick the helpful ones. Then the helpful resources uh, were shown again and asked, would you cite these? Would you actually cite it in the project? Um, they just said a quick yes or no to that. Then we asked them about those ones they didn't choose. Why wasn't this helpful? Or why didn't you click on this? What didn't you like about that? And they went through those. Then they rated the credibility of the resources they found helpful on a scale of one to five. And the final task was called a container task, where they were presented with a pre-selected set of those results and asked to identify the container. Was that in a book? Was that in a journal? Was that a blog post? And they had to choose that one. So they, that's one minute of this. The sessions took anywhere from, I think our shortest was around 38 minutes to over two and a half hours because it was self-paced based on the students' experiences. Uh, so we did get 175 of those. Uh, we used a think aloud protocol, so they were talking and, and telling us what they thought the whole time. And today our, uh, our contestants are going to see how well they know today's students and see if they can kind of guess how they responded to some of the things they found on Google. Now, those simulations were built with a software called Articulate Storyline. It's used for uh, creating uh, interactive uh, online classes, and we just, I don't want to say hacked it, but I can't think of a better word, and just uh, made it work for us and capture a lot of data for us. It was, uh, it was quite rich with, with data. So, that leaves us. with a few vocabulary lessons. So that last task about containers, um, we are rather obsessed with that issue of where students, uh, the information used to be in these print containers, 
and those were getting a lot of context clues of where that information con came from and how it got to you, to where everything is you know, now online. These are the eight containers that they did in their task. Um, and what does it look like when they all look alike on a flat computer screen? And uh, we're um, very obsessed with this. We call it the, the concept container collapse because there is definite confusion when you move it to the, just the online total digital mode. Now, one more vocabulary thing, because we're going to use this a lot, make sure our contestants don't get confused. We'll say the word SERPs a lot. We made search engine results pages, but really, again, we're talking about Google's particular SERPs. Now, we did study 175 students, but the questions today for the contestants are only going to come from the 90 higher education students. So 30 community college students, 30 university undergraduate students, and 30 graduate students. And now, that's your intro. Uh, there's only one question left, and that's, are you ready to play? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, then, let me introduce you to your host for today's game. He's big, he's bad, he's all business. He's Sam Putnam. <laughs> Both of the things I need for this, the clicker and the microphone. So thank you so much for being here. <laughs> this is an exciting moment for everyone here, I know, but personally for me too. It's the first time I tricked my colleagues into letting me run a game show at a conference. It is fake news or fake news. Thank you so much for being here again. I am super excited. There's all sorts of animations. It's going to get real good. You're going to be crying, you're going to be laughing, mainly you're going to be telling your friends. But like my colleague Tara Cataldo said, I am Sam Putnam. The aspect ratio is off on this projector, so I don't want to be unusual. I'm an engineering librarian from the University of Florida. Uh, I used to have longer hair, but then the police made me cut it for certain reasons. They said I showed up too often. So I look a little bit better right now. But our second colleague coming up here to present with me is Amy Mueller. Amy. Amy's an engineering librarian from the University of Florida. She's a terrific colleague, and she is also always dressed like this, never like anything else. Our third host of the day is going to be all the way from OCLC. He's an associate research scientist. It's Chris Sear. Got catchphrases for days, people. <laughs> we're so glad that all of you are here, and we're mostly glad that some of you decided that you actually want to be a contestant in this, uh, because we were certain that no one would want to do that. But you did, and so if we wrote your name down earlier, I'll probably be calling you in a second. So, we track that. We're going forward. I'm going to explain the game rules to you, okay? First, there will be two contestants who will be asked a question that's based on data from our research project, okay? Uh, each contestant will be asked to guess in the form of a percentage, so that's going to be on a scale from 1 to 100. All right, they're going to write down that percentage on some dry erase boards we got up here, and the contestant with the closest guess to the correct percentage wins a point. Sound easy enough? I saw a lot of nodding and only a couple people left during this. <laughs> so next it's time for you to come on down. Belinda from the University of Notre Dame Tara's going to guide you to where to go. And Jeff from Wabach College. Yes, Jeff. I promise you these two have never actually met before. So, aside, the jazzy music aside, would you please uh, to be interested in uh, telling us a little bit about yourself? Is there a microphone right there? Don't grab it though. You can just talk at a it's normal volume. Yes. Hi, I'm Belinda Overman. I work at the University of Notre Dame in the Hesburgh Library in electronic resources. And your library is famous for everything. <laughs> something, something on the outside. Tell us oh, about the um, outside. Touchdown Jesus, which is yes. the most famous outside the library. 
and we're really good football. My daughter graduated from Notre Dame, oh, so it's a warm connection for us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm Jeff Beck from Wabash College, I'm the library director. This is my ninth Charleston conference. It's the best, best place to go in November. Excellent. Thank you so much. So we're going to get right to the game, though. The first round is going to be news you can use. News you can use. These are all questions related to our students' perceptions of news. When we say our students, we're referring to only higher education students. So we're referring to that cohort that Tara talked about, those three cohorts we talked about earlier. So we're only talking about higher education students. So I hope that helps you influence how you're going to answer. So the first question is, what percentage of students found an AP story on YouTube helpful? So you have a dry erase board there in front of you. There is also a paper, two, some sheets of paper in front of you that have the picture of the website that they saw, as well as the Google snippet, and you're welcome to refer to those. So for everyone who's watching along, this is the AP story on YouTube that they saw. Lovely, lovely uh, little piece. And that's actually the Google snippet that they used. Google snippet. Do you both have your percentages written down? Yes. All right. We're going to start with Jeff first. Jeff said, 47%. Why 47%, Jeff? My favorite number. <laughs> when in doubt. Melinda. 50%. Very close. Both of you. Very close. Why 50? Just something to say. That's what I usually do. When I was in school, it was like it was just an answer and it was acceptable. Uh, and that is why I went to community college. That is a real true story. I hope everyone learns from my mistakes. Alright, so let's see what the actual 32%. 32%. So we got Jeff going with his favorite number, never steering him wrong. He's going to get one point for getting the first question right. Congratulations, Jeff. We're moving on to question two, though. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. We're moving on to our explanation from our librarian, Amy Buell. Thank you, everyone. So why didn't more students select the AP videos helpful? Perhaps it was the all caps. 12% of students actually remarked on this, and you can see it a quote here. You too. I don't know why all cap stuff see, it sounds like a really old man with a computer yelling at me. And I am not going to play that. <laughs> or perhaps it was the video format as a turnoff. We actually found, though, that there was a 50 50 split between the negative and positive judgments regarding video format. So you can see encapsulated in these two uh, quotes. Positively, I may look at the YouTube uh, YouTube thing just to see the video, just because they're quick and easy and uh, to just see and visualize. And a negative comment: Burmese pythons killing wildlife in the Everglades. It's a YouTube video, so I definitely can't use that. Though it would be nice to watch, but it's still nothing I can use in an actual paper. Thank you so much, Amy. We're moving on to question two now. So. Jeff, Belinda, what percentage of students that found an NPR interview helpful also found it citable? So they found it helpful, but they also found it citable. Say you paid a clock going now. We've got our screenshot up here of what the NPR article looked like, as well as the snippet that they attended to when they were in the SERPs. That isn't just a region in the Balkans, it's also an acronym. Both of you have an answer? We'll go with Jeff first. Jeff, what do you say? Uh, 67. 67. Is it because it's 20 more than 47? No, no. It's not all caps. Um, it might have a little bit of credibility. I'm not sure how many students appreciate it beyond. So. <laughs> all right, excellent. Belinda? 70%. You guys are on the same page. <laughs> More than the Notre Dame connection happening here, I'm feeling some something cosmic connected between you. Why, why 70? I also think it looks a little bit more credible. Looks a little bit more credible. All right. Well, we'll see what our students thought. Random number generator, what do you think? 59%. Jeff edging out again. So uh, we're going to play the third question. We'll keep them both up here. Uh, but Chris is going to give us a little bit more information about this question. So the most common uh, thing that students attended to during this was the fact that this is an interview and they were reluctant to cite because of that. One student saying, quote, the second one, Florida's Python problem, this, 
I'm not even going to bother with this because it's an NPR. This is like an interview. And there might be one or two things that are helpful, but out of the 20 sites that I've picked, I'm sure I can find better. So I'm going to say no to this. At the same time, there were a few students who noticed that the person being interviewed is an expert in the subject. So about 7% of students actually attended to the expertise. One of them saying, quote, so NPR, yes, because they have a professor that is knowledgeable in the field. It would be easy to cite it because it was a publication, an interview. Thank you so much. Uh, so question three, we'll get you both out of here right after this. We're going to ask you, what percentage of our students said the New York Times article was not credible by giving it a one on a five-point Likert scale? So what percentage of our students said the New York Times article was not credible by giving it a one on a five-point Likert scale? This is uh, what the page looked like again. Hashtag fake news. As well as the Google snippet, you can see right there. What percentage gave it a 1 on a scale from 1 to 5? That is the lowest possible score you could give on a likelihood scale. We have two answers. 10%. 10%, a lot of faith in our students there. 22%. Jeff, a little less faith. Well, let's see if we're keeping the faith around here. Love this noise. We're looking at 6%, a very low number. Belinda getting the question right, although losing the round to Jeff Congratulations. We're going to get an explanation, though, from Amy Bueller, a little more about how our students perceive news. So, in fact, Sam, uh, New York Times average credibility score with the students was a 3.6 out of 5. And you can see encapsulated in a quote here, well, New York Times has some prestige, and I think uh, the facts they may include are trustworthy. Whatever the opinion or bias is that I find a fact there or some information regarding things that happen, I know that I'll be able to trust, rather than a blog or something like that, or a YouTube video. Another exchange here, students. New York Times, I think it's highly credible also. They generally fact check. Facilitator questions, yeah, but you gave it a four. Student says, yeah, just because it's an article for viewers and not, such a, not a scientific article, it can still have biases and things like that. <laughs> Sorry, we've got a little head. Thank you so much, both of you, for volunteering. You can either go back to your seat. We actually have a special reserve seat up here for you up front, but you're right there on the aisle. I think you're good. I also think he's a little bit done. But we're going to move on to round two, and I'm not going to skip my cue again. Round two, say my name, say my name. These ones are all about scholarly publishers. Scholarly publishers, so how, how the students attended those names. We're asking Tressa from the Massachusetts Public Library System to come on up. And I apologize if I get this wrong, but Davika from World Bank? Is that correct? Yep. Uh, excellent. Thank you so much, both of you, for coming up. Uh, Tressa, would you start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Uh, yep, I'm Tressa Santello. I'm the Electronic Resources Coordinator at the Massachusetts Library System. It's a uh, multi-type consortium in Massachusetts that has 1,600 members. We support public libraries, academic libraries, school libraries, and special libraries. So I'm representing Massachusetts. Yeah. 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 tell us a little bit about yourself. So I am the Marketing and Outreach Lead at World Bank Publications in Washington. We are part of the UN family, um, specializing in um, ending poverty, and so on. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you again for volunteering. I'm going to ask you a question about those names, about how students attempt to scholarly publishers. So the first question is, you all both remember how to play? What percentage of students said that a Springer Link ebook was a book? <laughs> so here is the web page that they saw, as well as the Google snippet. You may notice it actually says download book in two locations on this page. So how many were able to correctly identify this ebook from Springerlink as a book? Looks like Dabika's locked in. Trust the thinking hard on this one. We'll go with Dabika first though. 33%. We're looking at one third. Why so low? I don't know if they distinguish. I don't know if they 
Do they know that most of them are going to be building? I'm just not sure. Sure, totally. Trust me. Uh, very high. Nope. 92%. Tons of faith. <laughs> Love it. Why so high? Um, so if they're seeing the options of download, that means they can get it instantly. They think they're going to get it instantly. Okay. All right. Let's see what the random number generator finally spits out. We're actually looking at 48% of students. So Davika is going to be the closest with 38%. Congratulations, Davika. We're going to get a little bit more information about this from Chris Sear. It turns out that students can recognize ebooks, but branding matters. We also showed them a book contained in Google Books, and in that one, 100% labeled it as a book. Uh, this is in line with other research presented right here at the Charleston Conference, where 76% of people were able to identify a Google book as a book, but only 28% identified a Springer ebook as a book. So if people aren't associating Springer ebooks with books, what are they associating it with? Well, it turns out that they associate Springer with journals. 39% of students selected Springer as a journal, one of them saying, quote, Springer, another journal. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a published book from Springer, so I guess that would be considered a journal. <laughs> I don't know. So, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. So, to be just head one out right now, we're going to move on to question two. What percentage of students gave a JSTOR magazine article a credibility score of four or five on a five point Likert scale? All right, so this is a JSTOR magazine article, credibility score of four or five on a five point Likert scale. That is the page that they saw right there. Lovely JSTOR icon in the top left corner, iconic. Remember when I was in school? Keep the question away. Oh, I'm sorry. I can go back. What percentage of students gave a JSTOR magazine article a credibility score of four or five by a five point Likert scale? I'm going to start the music again because I love it so much. <laughs> And there's the snippet. We'll go ahead, Tressa, what did you say this time around? 87%, another very high percent. Strong faith. Why 87%? Um, I think JSTOR, to their credit, is one of the most recognizable uh, scholarly publication providers across all levels of higher ed. Certainly, to be here. 88%. I don't have my glasses on, so I'm not going to be able to do this math. 88%. Similar reasoning? Same reason. Alright. Let's have a look. What do we think it is? 82%. Trust it, just five points off. Uh, excellent job. We're going to hear a little bit more about uh, JSTOR from Amy Bueller. of students recognized JSTOR during the simulation and said things like, I'd give this one a five because we use it a lot in school. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> However, sometimes uh, this brand recognition could not outweigh the content of the resource as seen here. This seems a little more pop science-y, so even though it's published by JSTOR, I'd give it a four. I mean, I'm sure the information is credible, but not to the level of certain other kinds of publications. <laughs> Thanks so much, Amy. So we have a tie, gridlocked here, going into the final question of the round. This question is going to be, what percentage of students found a nature.com press release helpful? All right. So what percentage of students found a nature.com press release helpful? So we'll give you a look at the page, as well as our snippet up here on the top. See what they were looking at, see what they were attending to. What are we thinking? Dabika locked in early. What's your answer? 27%. 27%, fairly low. Why 27? I'm not sure how they would react to the customers. Sure. It's a strange, uh, strange piece of information, right? Trust 67? 61. Should have worn my glasses. 61%. A little significantly higher. Yeah. Um, I think maybe because it's associated with nature, possibly. Yeah. Sure. As we've learned so far, brand matters. Let's see how much it matters in this case. Wubbling, wubbling. 47%. Super close for Tressa. 27%. So 
we we trust that it gets the win on this one. Woo! Only 14 off, although very, very close. Congratulations, Tressa, for winning the round. Right. Want to go to Chris Sear? Yeah, give her a round of applause. Yeah. We're gonna get a little bit more information about that from Chris. If we haven't made it clear already, brand matters. This was just a little tiny press release from Nature, but 20% of students recognized the fact that it was Nature. One of them saying, "Quote." Oh, Nature is good. Nature is one of the premier science article publishers. They were what most scientists aspire to. So let's see if they have any good information. And not really. I'm not very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> sources. I hope the source in high regard, but I wouldn't cite it. Having said that, this one also demonstrated the limits of branding, because students might recognize a brand, but also incorrectly recognize it. One student saying, well, I picked the Nature.com one because I like the show Nature. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. So we're moving on to round three. We're going to have two more contestants come up. This is round three. Our theme is Don't Contain Me, Bro. So uh, these are we're from the University of Florida, so for those of you with a long enough memory, it maybe means something to you. But these are all questions related to the aforementioned containers. We'll, we'll just see my side conversation up here, that's fine. Um, and we're asking out Lisa from Taylor and Francis. Lisa. Wendy from the University of British Columbia. Is Wendy still around? Would uh, Wendy, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, I'm Wendy Trask. I'm an education librarian from the University of British Columbia, which is the most beautiful campus in the world. <laughs> Probably hard to argue with that. Hi, I'm Lisa Danner. Um, and I'm a Taylor Francis. I'm marketing in the library of reference products, specifically ChemNetics. All right. Thank you so much for volunteering. I want to get right to the questions, though. I'm sure you both remember how to play. I've been playing close attention, tasting, taking very good notes. But round one, question one, round three, question three. Who knows where we are? What is time? It's merely a construct. Uh, what percentage of students recognize that a JSTOR magazine article was contained in a magazine? So that means they were able to accurately identify this magazine article as being from a magazine. Okay, what percentage of students were able to do that? We have our screenshot up here, looks a little bit familiar, if you were paying attention earlier, as well as our snippet, able to correctly identify this as a magazine coming from a magazine, coming from a magazine. We are locked in. Yes. Wendy, 20 percent, <laughs> a low number. Why so low? I, I, mean, I think that, that that brand recognition trumps the um, the, the computer. Sure, they can recognize it maybe the credibility of it or the helpfulness of it, but not necessarily the container. Lisa, I'm not familiar with JSTOR, JSTOR, but I guess because it says volume number, they might. <laughs> so 87 <87%. laughs> percent. That might be the journal. <laughs> sure. <laughs> We'll see. What are we thinking? It's going to land on 12%. Did you guess 12%? What did you guess? 20%. Uh, I don't know what's going on up here. With a little, like, uh, with a little bit more information, though, about uh, the container, specifically magazines, we're going to talk to Amy. if anyone's interested. Yes. <laughs> We're already recording it, which is embarrassing enough for all of us. Uh, 
uh, round three, question two, though, we're asking you what percentage of students recognized a New York Times blog post as a blog? Okay? So we've got our music here. Here is the picture of the blog post. Feel free to refer to your uh, sheets as well. And then there is our snippet. If you're wondering how they might know it's a blog, it does say blog in the URL. <laughs> it can be very, very tricky. Very, very tricky. Oops. Getting ahead of myself. The answer is not 22, I guarantee you that. 70% release it. It says blog. Correct. There you go. Excellent reason. So, the actual answer though is 78%. Lisa, tying it up. With a little bit more information about blogs, let's talk to Chris Sear. It turns out that students actually do pay attention to the URL. When they were trying to label this container, 27% of students mentioned the URL. One of them saying, quote, I can see the URL in the link. It contains blog, so it's a blog. Another one saying, quote, that one's definitely a blog because there's a blog in the link. And third student saying, quote, it says blog. It says a blog in the URL. Blog right there. We can contrast this with another blog post that they looked at where it didn't say blog anywhere in the URL, and there only about 20% of students labeled it as a blog. So they're both. It's okay. We, you are at an angle, and you know your sheets. It's fine. It's fine. All right. That was question three. Okay. Round three. Question three. So this is our last question on the round. This is our tiebreaker. High stakes here. High stakes. What percentage of students recognize that a Journal of Herpetology article? So that's an article from the Journal of Herpetology on Bio One was contained in a journal. So who's able to recognize the journal article from the Journal of Herpetology as a journal? <laughs> so who's able to identify that the container was a journal of the Journal of Herpetology? What percentage? It says Journal of Herpetology. We have 80% and 81%. Very close. So it's basically who's right on or a little bit under. So both of you thought that students are not that tense. <laughs> well, it's a journal of on the top. I'm just going to go with that. I don't think that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say they didn't try to over Let's see. Number generator 92%. <laughs> So that's Lisa with the 81% 11 off, super close, but she comes away with the win. Congratulations to Lisa. We're going to get, yeah, give her a hand. Yeah, this is a very important, very important game for We're going to get a little bit more information about that from Amy Bueller, though. Hey. Well, Sam, this was our most correctly identified journal. And having journal in a title in the URL, similar to that uh, New York Times blog post, is helpful. As you can see from this quote, student, and that is a journal, facilitator. So yeah, what's leading you to select journal for that one, student? The URL says Journal of Herpetology. Now we juxtapose this against our least correctly identified journal, which was Integrative Zoology from Wiley. Uh, it was only identified as a journal by 63% of students. Several of the a large uh, minority actually identified as a book. And so you can see from this quote below that a lot of students equivocated widely with books. Ecological correlates of invasion impact? Okay, so widely online libraries, so they have a book. Thank you so much, Amy. We're going to be moving on to our last and final round, round four. Serps up dudes. <laughs> We're looking for our next two contestants here. Can we have Claire from the University of Cambridge? Are you still here, Claire? Yeah. And so this person had a university's name that I did not recognize. So it's Aaron, and you put like MCPHS. Okay, great. Come on. This is our 
So thank you so much, both of you, for coming out, volunteering, being a part of this very important event, special for our culture in this time, that we are examining SERP sub dudes, search engine result pages up dudes. <laughs> Aaron, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, hi, I'm Aaron from the, what used to be known as Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, and they just shortened it. Um, I'd be allowed to have free services librarian and Ashley. My colleague Karen sitting next to me was the first one to sign up, so she said, if I'm doing it, you have to do it too. So <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Karen. The world needs more Karens. Claire, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm Claire Sewell from the University of Cambridge in England, and I'm the new, I always get this wrong because I've just changed job, research court librarian for the physical sciences. No pressure. Excellent. Congratulations on the new position. Serves up to you. It's round one. You both guys both know how to play. You've been watching intently, taking notes, texting your friends and family, I'm sure. Question one, round four. What percentage of students made their helpful judgments using only the information found in the SERPs? So found in the search engine research page. They didn't click into any of them. And they made all of their judgments. <laughs> what percentage of students did that? So this is what our uh, simulation uh, page looked like that they would have saw for this task. Basically, the primary difference is we have these check boxes here, and they would have just checked those. They would have never clicked into a resource. And both of you are locked in. So we're going to go with Aaron first. I said 70%. 70% through the roof. <laughs> Why did you choose 70? Just working with students when they've been doing things with uh, lots of things, but library databases, a lot of people don't click. They just go based on the title, and then from there they say, yes, I can use this, no, I can't use this. Excellent. I've seen it a ton as well. Claire. I'm at high end. 85%. <laughs> For the same reasons. Same reasons. We've all seen it before. Is it actually accurate though? We actually only saw 10% of students not click in. So it is shocking. But maybe good? Who knows? Chris will tell us a little bit more. Well, 10% is not that high in the grand scheme of things. It is every librarian's worst fear come true. Ooh. I know if anyone is going on a ghost tour while in Charleston, but that's going to be child's play compared to this. Students judging resources without even bothering to look at them. And it turns out that this is even worse for the K-12 students that did the simulation, where a full 22% of them went through and did the entire thing judging if they would be helpful, judging if they would be citable, judging if they are credible, judging what container they are, without actually bothering to look at any of these web pages. Thanks so much, Chris. Moving on to this next question. What percentage of students that found a Wikipedia article helpful also found it citable? Okay, so a lot of students we see will find a Wikipedia article helpful, but do they find it citable? What percentage? There's a Wikipedia page. I'm sure none of you have ever seen one of these before. <laughs> and also there is our snippet. and both of you are locked in already. We're going to go with Claire first this time around. 49%. 49%. Hmm. All right. I like it. So you're right in the middle of the road, which means I can't say anything well, if it's higher or lower. Well, just the side of the middle of the road. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron. 12%. 12%. Yeah. Okay. All right. So what are we thinking? Are we thinking very low number? High number? Number generator will tell us. 13%. That was so close. <laughs> You get it spot on, I actually give you a new car. So <laughs> it's a shame that you were just one on. 13% um, though. And so that is uh, Aaron's round, correct? Right? Who knows? I'm not really paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> but with a little bit more information about that, we're going to go over to our librarian in waiting, Amy. Well, thank you, Sam. So although 13 students deemed the Wikipedia article citable, 69% found it helpful. So students articulated what could be uh, coined as Wikipedia shaming. Mm -hmm. Wikipedia is usually right. I wouldn't cite it, but it's usually written by people who know what they're talking about. Or a more passionate stance from one student. I hate that it's shamed, that you shouldn't use it, because it's, I don't know, and in my generation, everything. I feel like they're going to go in there. I've actually found it to be very concise and kind of a little uh, nugget of information that allows me to explore further. And 
poor Wikipedia. <laughs> I'm upset that people are so mean about it. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag poor Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> moving on though to question three. We're tied? No, I don't. No. Oh, Aaron's already Claire's going to steal this one, I can tell. <laughs> question three of the round. What percentage of students selected the National Park Service page as helpful? All right, so National Park Service page is very high in our search engine results pages on the first page. A lot of students clicked into this. What percentage of students found this helpful? <coughs> Lovely looking page. Look at this vista. Don't you want to go to the Everglades? Like in August? <laughs> no? Okay. All right. Uh, let's go with Aaron. Aaron. I said 43%. 43% found it helpful. Why 43%? I think um, the people will click just based on what's in the snippet, you don't get the exact words dangerous um, or anything like that, so it's just sort of, it, you have to know what you're talking about before you actually make the judgment call. All right, Claire. From 77 to 99. Oh, there we go, Claire. Let's take her to Vegas later, and then we'll see what the actual answer is, though. Number resolving, 88%. Claire, lucky number comes in handy. And we're going to have a little bit more information about this particular result from Chris Sear, our scientist. It turns out that most students feel like, contrary to what your uncle who lives in the cabin in the woods might tell you, you actually can trust the government. And in particular, students looked at the URL and noticed there was a .gov there, with 56% of it mentioning it at some point of these in the simulation. One of them captured this trust for the National Park Service by saying, quote, NPS. I was unsure about this one. I'm not sure if it's considered academic or not. I'm going to go with yes just because it says .gov. Thank you so much, Chris, and thank you so much to our contestants, Aaron, coming to the round. That's going to keep Aaron in our mind to keep you up here because we have our final round, and this is our prize winning round. So if any of the previous winners want to come up and win some of our fabulous prizes, it's your time to shine. Yeah, sure. That was awesome. Complete the juicy quote. So basically what we're asking you to do in this round is we, we took so many transcripts, we, we uh, interviewed so many students, and we heard so many great quotes. We're asking you if you can fill in the blank and complete the juicy quote. Please keep your answers to yourselves until I ask you to reveal them at the end. But the first juicy quote we're going to see is, what's a blank? <laughs> so the word bank underneath is actually uh, a collection of containers. So what's a blank? This is a common question, the most common question from our students by far. <laughs> most common question. So we're going to go with Tressa first, because she's on the left. What's a preprint? Let's see what Aaron has to say. What's a preprint? What's a preprint? <laughs> what's a journal? <laughs> I was really glad that none of them asked that, so that was the ending for this one. But just about everyone asked this, and the correct answer is, what is a preprint? So, sadly, Aaron, you are done for their game. I'm this is so, this Lisa, Lisa, Sam is the worst. I'm Sam. Uh, but you do get a fabulous prize. Tara. Are you Tara? <laughs> Comes with you. This is a DVD copy of Julie starring Jennifer Lopez and Brad Pitt. Uh, and a button. And a button. Oh. And I love Marston Button, which is the oh, science yes. library that a lot of us are from. You know, we All right. So back to messing up more people's names. Second question. So blank. I would not choose. Well, I'm lying. I would choose. <laughs> There's a word bank underneath. What resource do you think they were talking about? So blank. I would not choose. Well, I'm lying. I would choose. What do we think they were talking about? We're going to start with Jeff. Wikipedia. All right. What about Aaron? Wikipedia. What about Tressa? New York Times. Let's see. Either Tress is going away with a new car or this is actually a quote from a graduate student. He said Wikipedia. 
So Wikipedia, again, that sort of idea of Wikipedia shaving. Would choose it, but actually wouldn't choose it. So Tressa, we're sorry to lose you, but you have a fabulous prize coming your way. This is an eight track. <laughs> This is a, uh, we're going to keep going. Another film of life. I want to look at this one first because it's a dot blank. Just because I trust those where I'm told to trust them. <laughs> dot blank. What are we thinking here? Aaron, Jeff? Dot edu dot gov. Ooh, a split. We're going to end up with a winner on this one. Dot edu dot gov. Let's see what it is. This was an undergraduate student. He actually said .gov, so that live gives Jeff the win. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to give you another terrible prize, though. This is from 101 <laughs> tissue covers. 101 tissue covers. There's actually a note inside that talks about the, you need to count the thread count. Don't trust the written thread count. <laughs> Yeah, very important. So that leaves looks you trust it. <laughs> leaves Jeff as our winner. Congratulations, Woo! Jeff. <laughs> you have your choice of either uh Well, Harris said you threw one more round. Can you answer one more question? Did you get the bonus thing? Oh, we're gonna make him answer another question. <laughs> <laughs> he's got good enough that he's got them all right so far. <laughs> Tara's in charge, huh? I don't know. All right. Teachers don't usually like blank as one of your sources. Put a word blank below. Can I get some help? <laughs> yes. yes. Hey, feel free to shout out. Text, video, video audio. Video. 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 B for video. B for video. Community college students said this. And it is. It's video. <laughs> so not only do you get a VHS copy of Field of Dreams. <laughs> But you also get a yes. button and a UF Libraries t-shirt, oh, wow. which you will never wear. <laughs> it's great for your artwork. <laughs> Jeff, thank you so much. Congratulations on the picture. And by our other contestants who didn't win a drink as well. well we're going to do this one with the crowd just for fun. So if it's a library, it's probably from, or if it's a library, it's probably from a bet blank, and blanks are usually true. Which one do we think this is? Books. 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 That's right. Community college students said this, and it is books. And so, last round for everyone to play along? Now we're gonna get out of here. I'm just kidding. What percentage of students recognize Peer J as a preprint? Who knows, is everyone familiar with Peer J? How many can recognize it as a preprint? So that it is. It says preprint in the URL. Uh, it says preprint on other parts of the page as well. Do we have any guesses? 10%? 1%? 1%? 1%? 1%? 1%? 1%? 1%? 1%? 1%? 1%? 1%? 1%? 1%? 1%? 1%? 1%? 1%? 1%? 1%? 1%? 1%? 1%? 1%?
helpfulness. What was that? What are students talking about when they're talking about helpfulness? You're assisting from sightability and uh, reliability, right? So can you tell them more about that? Um, yeah, so, and actually I had a question over there that actually kind of relevant, so I'm going to bring yours up as well. I was asking, you know, did the students have any instruction before they went through those tasks? And they did not. It was coming in, we, um, we actually, that, we saw what's a preprint. We would not answer that question until the session was in. We would not answer any one, all their um, behaviors to be what they knew up to that point. Um, and so that first one was deliberately vague. What, what did helpful mean to them? Um, they each had their assignment on the Burmese Python and Florida Everglades, but then with the six cohorts, um, the, it was tailored to, you know, what was something they would actually have at that age level in the graduate students. This is, a, you're, you're starting your dissertation and the elementary students, you know, you're just doing a little a science report. Um, so it was deliberately vague to start off, okay, what's one's helpful? And because we gave them no other parameters in that assignment, so it was kind of like, what am I used to? What am I had experience? What have my teachers expected of me? And it kind of varied a lot whether what they thought was helpful. Some of it went right to that sightable. They were in the helpful task we're talking about sightability. Um, and others others did not. There was just what's giving me some, you know, any kind of information. And again, you had the ones that didn't go any further than the Google service. Yeah, just uh, anecdotally, I noticed the K through 12 students were a lot less likely to make that distinction between helpful and sightable. So typically, almost anything that they would select as helpful, they would then on the sightable task just go through and say, "Oh yeah, I take this one. I take this one. I take this one." Uh, they were a lot more likely to select videos as helpful uh, than students who were in higher cohorts. Uh, another finding I thought was really interesting is, as you go up in educational cohort, you are more likely to select the Wikipedia source as helpful, but also less likely to select the Wikipedia source as citable. And so I think this is showing that there is a major disconnect between how people are actually using Wikipedia and then how they're saying they're using Wikipedia in their research, where they're not citing it, even though, I mean, they're using the sources in their paper. Mm -hmm. I was say, uh, so the other thing is that we sort of sequence the tasks purposely, right? So we started, like as Tara said, with that sort of nebulous, well, which ones do you find helpful? Not giving them any sort of any more sort of leading aspects. And then we sort of, you know, progressed through those tasks so that we got them to sort of start thinking about evaluating those resources they selected a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And some of them did it right off the bat in the helpful task, and some of them so several tasks till they got to that point. So it was really interesting to see that. Does that answer your question? That's what I thought it was more tidbit. We don't talk about it. There was a lot of data we, there. We showed you know the 10% the didn't click on and open it up for the whole simulation. Um, but there, uh, we haven't crunched the numbers yet. There's, there was a bunch who didn't open them up until that container task. They were just making their judgments. And then they got to the container and they're like, I don't know, and they would actually click on it then, and that was kind of interesting that that question brought out more evaluation. Other questions? Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Privilege winning. Were any snakes harmed in the course of this project? <laughs> <laughs> Only rubber ones. Um, no, but there were a lot of students that were uh, really freaked out about the snakes being the topic. And, uh, yeah, they, they were grossed out. My real question is, um, this is entertaining for us, um, and it helps us appreciate some things. Have you tried applying this game format with your students, having them responding as a kind of information literacy approachable way, a fun way to think about journals and, and all the kinds of containers we've been talking about? Uh, so the game show was uh, was my idea, so I can answer the game show question. I'm also the I do probably the most in struggle well, terrorism. Oh, right. Okay. So, um, no, I haven't thought about that, but it's a really good idea. Um, anytime you engage your students actively in uh, the process of learning and information literacy, uh, I would agree with it. But I do like that, that idea of it. Although I uh, would be uh, careful to not get into, if, if students perform poorly, um, it might not be as fun for them. Pick and choose what you Yeah. <laughs> yes. Give us some easy wins. I'm just wondering about this Wikipedia shaming. Were you able to find that are students actually using Wikipedia but just not citing it as a way to get around it? Like that 
that are secretly using the information, putting it in their papers, but just not citing it because they know they'll get slammed, or they think they'll get slammed by the professor. Yeah, they're using Wikipedia a whole lot for citation chaining. So they'll go to Wikipedia, see what sources they're citing, and then usually they'll just cite those sources um, in a lot of cases without even evaluating them, just kind of figuring, well, if it's in Wikipedia, it's probably good. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of how they're getting around citing Wikipedia. Uh, other times they might just mention it's common knowledge, or I remember having one student one time ask me, so is it true that if you're using Wikipedia, you don't need to cite it? Um, which, no, that is not true. <laughs> I was just going to say, as a, as a caveat, the scope of this research project doesn't really look at the point of them actually then ending up yeah. using the resource, which actually would be a very interesting way to kind of continue this on, because we just follow them through sort of this mock process of would they use it. And uh, many of them were surprisingly honest, I think, about if they do use it, they would use it. And, oh. Think very highly. Uh, so, what would you tell publishers or aggregators? Uh, what would you tell them? What would be that number one recommendation? <laughs> 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 it would be very obvious. <laughs> so, if it's important for you to, um, what like if that container thing is important and. Uh, you, it bothers you as a publisher that they may be labeling you as only one. You're gonna to have to be more obvious with your labeling. Um, that you get that that Google Books and the 100 percent that is the only resource out of 65 that were in the simulations that be 100 percent on anything. Um, and then it's labeled every you know all over the page. It says book 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 book, <laughs> and you know it kind of made it obvious. They again you can see over and over again having it in the URL. Um, you know that kind of I think it's important to point out too that Google's ubiquity in our culture leads a lot to them being able to have that 100% identifier because they Google something in Google and then Google is pushing their content to them directly. So they've encountered Google Books a hundred times more than they've encountered a Springer ebook, right? Um, but it, the URL, I think, is the big thing. Like, they have so many students attend to the URL. They read the URL. They're looking at the domain, and in terms of Google Books, they're looking at books.google. Like, it's right there in the URL. Like, they, they're really interested in the URL, and that's something that I didn't think was going to be the case going into this. The other one that I noticed uh, was really ubiquitous in terms of branding was time. So that resource, we didn't ask about it during the container task. Uh, but it doesn't say magazine anywhere on the website, anywhere in the URL, and yet students didn't even refer to it as Time. They called it Time Magazine over and over. Uh, so it's just one of those kind of branding things where they're not even necessarily thinking about magazines. They're just saying, oh yeah, Time Magazine, I would use that. Yeah, I just thought it would be interesting to do it the same thing with the professors because we all know these students come to the desk and they're like, I only can use peer-reviewed articles. They can't use videos. They can't use even, um, one professor doesn't even want me to show the students' reference books anymore. He's like, because they were, they were overusing them, I guess, in their citations and not delving deeper than, you know, that first layer. But, um, and, and, I mean, some of them don't even want me to show dissertations or any of that kind of thing. They just want articles. And so it'll be interesting to see what their perception is. And they're still kind of keep trying to keep up with, with the mass amounts of formats that are coming in as well. So. Yeah. That would also, that's interesting because I think it can vary a lot by discipline too. So uh, prior to this position, I was actually a political science professor, so outside of library. Uh, I made it through a decade in that discipline, not only not knowing what a preprint was, but having never even heard the term preprint. So uh, it's something I think you really will just see a lot of variation uh, based on some of the different disciplines. How about running this test with faculty? and seeing what the results would be. Because I would like to get my faculty to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> it would just be interesting, interesting to see how much misinformation is coming from the teacher themselves. That'd be interesting because you could do it with like K-12 faculty too. Yeah. That'd be, yeah, if you could get a grant for it, that'd be really interesting. We have, um, we, we've literally thought of about 50 different spin-off projects right. to this project. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Yeah. Um, something too to consider is you know we're all these students were from our Alachua County, in uh, you know in Florida, um, and so this is also you know potentially an examination of the information literacy instruction and education of the state of Florida. Um, talking, we have a colleague from Rutgers who lives in Philadelphia and who has does a ton of work in, in school libraries. Uh, Joyce Valenza, who's also who's on the project, um, and she talks about you know the uh, scaffolding and standardization of information literacy teaching in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Um, and so I think it's like thinking about faculty and, and how much that they actually know. You know, the state of Florida doesn't have a lot of standardized information literacy education taught to our instructor, instructors K-12, and I think we see that in the university. Any other questions? Anyone upset they weren't a contestant? Uh, did you start it from the perspective of what, are your, like, what is your either teacher or like, professor like, think you're supposed to use? Because I wonder if that's a lot of like the bias, especially with the Wikipedia shaming. Like, starting as young as like fourth grade or like lowest grade you tested, I don't think that's uncommon, but I have a feeling it's coming from, they already have, they're maybe from the perspective of my teacher said I cannot use XYZ's assignments, so I automatically know I can't use it for whatever you're trying to do, you know. So, that. Figuring out like what that bias is from to begin with, and then either like crafting it around that and or being like, no, it's totally open. Like, this is what do you think? I don't know if that came into play at all. Um, like uh, we mentioned all the, the coding we did. A lot of what you saw here today came from the, the simulations, which is nice numbers and everything. But all the coding we did, we do have um, a code of for you know something wasn't recommended and not you know and not recommended. And I we haven't crunched that one yet, <coughs> unless you guys have. But it, it you, you, we definitely anecdotally we're seeing a lot. I mentioned when they weren't like even with Wikipedia, it was because my teacher said. My teacher said, my mother said, my parents said. Yeah, I've got a blog post coming out on this eventually, um, but one thing we looked at was the people whose teachers had discouraged, or just in general had people discouraging them from using Wikipedia, and ones who haven't, and they really didn't differ a whole lot in terms of how they write down the citability, things like that. So it's weird because they get a lot of information about Wikipedia, and yet it doesn't seem to have a huge impact on the way that they're using it. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for coming. Oh, yeah. For the, those consolation prizes for those that didn't win their round, please come up and get a button. You can have a, we'll have a button. There is a lot more Sour Patch Kids. Yes. There's going to be a round. You gather as many Sour Patch Kids. If you have any more questions, feel free to come up and ask us. Yeah, we'll discuss that later. Take a look. So, we'll see you last night.